stuck in wheat that harvesting, <laughs> you know, new combines. Yeah. I mean, that's the stuff I'm into. So, yeah. <laughs> Are we good to go here? Okay, great. All right. Thanks, everybody. Uh, good morning, everyone. I am Marty Dickinson. I'm the chair of the Board of Regents, and I'm welcoming you to our November 18th. Board of Regents meeting in lovely Vancouver. Thank you, Mel, for hosting us. We just wish that it was a, a tiny bit better weather because this is the best campus with the best view as far as just the scenic thing. It's so amazing. So Hopefully before the day is out. Yeah, okay. Well, if you could arrange that, maybe Shane, somebody could yeah, get on that. Um, so welcome, everybody. It's so nice to have so many um, faces in person. This feels really nice. So we are entering into the um, our strategic and operation excellence committee and we have a, a really wonderful morning of some excellent presentations that we're excited to um, have. So um, I think what I'd like to do is just quickly go around the room if you don't mind and make introductions so we just know who's here. So um, let's say start maybe Mel and then we'll go around this table and then we'll go around this way. Good morning, everyone. I'm Mel Netzhammer. Good morning. I'm Mel Netzhammer, Chancellor of Washington State University, Vancouver. I'm Obi Ford III. I'm Associate Vice Chancellor for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion here at Vancouver. Right. Go ahead on. You, we'll do the table first and then we'll go around okay, the room. Okay. Enrique Cerna, uh, Regent, appointed in uh, March 2020. Heather Redmond, Regent. Brett Blankenship, Regent. I've served about the same time as Kirk's tenure. So you're old. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm the old guy now. You're the old guy. <laughs> uh, Shane Wright, they, them, student regent. Uh, Kirk Schultz, president. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Jeanette Ramos, proud alum, first of all, and then regent. <laughs> Ron Sims, regent. Hi, Lisa Kihokalili Shower, Regent, hailing from Vancouver. So yeah. glad to see everyone here. <laughs> Laura Powell, Regent. David Turnbull, uh, faculty representative to the Board of Regents. All right, let's go. Guy yep. Ellaby, Office of Strategy, Planning, and Analysis. <laughs> Ray White, Director of System Strategy <clears throat> Planning. Mondo, ASWCV President. Evans Kramis, and Buddy Vice President. Paul Chancellor of Washington State University, Everett. Chris Floyd, Vice President, Strategy, Planning, and Analysis. What was that title again? I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Fran Ferguson, Executive Director of Institutional Research. Becky Landy, Assistant to the newly appointed Vice President. <laughs> Julia Getchell, Vancouver Director of Human Resources. Don Shear, Senior Vice President of the WSU Foundation. Sandra Haynes, Chancellor, Washington State University, Tri-Cities. Morning, everyone. I'm Phil Weiler, Vice President for Marketing and Communications. Good morning. I'm Stacy Pearson, Chief Financial Officer for the WSU System. Hi, Celestina Barbosa, like our Executive Vice Chancellor of Research and Administration, WCU Health Sciences. Good morning. My name is Colleen Kerr, Vice President for External Affairs and Government Relations. Good morning. I'm Cheryl Camerzel. I'm the Chief Risk and Compliance Officer. Laura Hill, Senior Vice Provost, sitting in for Provost Jensen. Morning, everyone. I'm Ellen Taylor, uh, she, her pronouns, and I am the Interim Vice President for Student Affairs. Hi, I'm Danielle Hepp, she, her pronouns, Attorney General's Office. Good morning, I'm Daryl Dwell, Vice President of Health Sciences and Chancellor of WSU Spokane. Christine Portforce, Vice Chancellor for Research and Graduate Education, WC Vancouver and WC Tri-City. Rennie Christopher, Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs, WSU Vancouver. Great. And who's the uh, two masterminds behind I uh, feel introduced <laughs> since we're all depending on you two? <laughs> Hi, I'm Chris Rhodes from WSU Vancouver, the IT department. And Kyle Leiby, part of the Office of Strategy Planning and Analysis, also IT. Great. Thank you, everybody. Welcome. Thanks very much. At this time, I'm going to turn it uh, to Chancellor uh, Mel Netzhammer to talk to us about WSU's equity um, impact, as well as we have OB4 joining us, and as you heard, Associate Vice Chancellor of Equity, Diversion, and Inclusion. So thanks for joining us. Thanks, Marty. Um, <clears throat> first of all, 
thanks, <clears throat> a thanks to Obi uh, for uh, stepping in. Zoe Heigl Strong uh, has been my co-chair on the committee, and uh, she uh, was ill uh, today, and so uh, Obi, on short notice, is going to do this presentation with <clears throat> me. So thank you very much, uh, and. Uh, and we wish Zoe the best in, in health. Uh, and, and first, let me just welcome everyone to campus. It's uh, always a, uh, an honor and, and a treat to uh, host the Board of Regents on, on our campus. Uh, but, but also, I think, given uh, the uh, core of equity that is central to our campus and, have, and our system, uh, and uh, being able to uh, address some of these issues uh, while we're, we're hosting is also uh, particularly special uh, to us. So thank you all so much for, for being here and, and welcome to WSU Vancouver. Um, <clears throat> we are going to talk today about what is really a preliminary report of the uh, equity uh, policy, equitable policy and procedure task force, which is a group that Kirk established uh, about a year ago, just over a year ago. Um, I'm gonna give you a little bit of background uh, around that, and then Obi will walk us through the uh, equity impact assessment tool that our uh, group has developed. And then after that, uh, we'd like to have a conversation uh, about equity and the, the importance of equity-mindedness in the work that, that we do. Uh, so the Equity Policy and Procedure Task Force originated from conversations uh, about equity that <clears throat> equity and policy specifically that President Schultz and I were, were having, along with many others. Um, and those conversations took on a new urgency uh, after the killing of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Aubrey, uh, and the events of spring 2020. Um, we agreed that it was important to condemn systemic racism in our communities, but we also needed to address systemic racism within higher education and specifically at Washington State University. That led to a series of discussions in the summer of 2020, uh, first with the president and then as our new provost arrived with, with Elizabeth Chilton about the importance of addressing equity in, in our policies. So uh, the president asked Zoe Heigl Strong and me to co-chair the task force with uh, the following members, several, several of whom are here today and have announced themselves. Uh, Celestina barbosa Liker, Laura Greiner-Hill, Danielle Hess, Colleen Kerr, and Obi Ford III, who are all here. Uh, um, Holly Ashkanajad, Brian Dixon, Gita Dutta, Lisa Gehring, Jamie Nolan, Anna Plemons, Dana Ulrich, Lisa, Lynn Varner and Shelby McKay were also members of our group. You may not know them specifically by their names. It's important to name them. And also that the uh, that represents every campus and many of the units across uh, WSU. Uh, it was an incredible group and every everyone on the group said it was the meeting they looked forward to the most. And it was also just such an honor to have these, these discussions with, with our colleagues uh, every other week for, for 18 months. Um, the, um, the, the, the context and the importance of the moment was always present for us as we began our work uh, last year. Uh, we started with preliminary shared readings that we all did, and then we began to look at policies that we thought were most in need of revision. Um, the uh, testing uh, admissions requirement was one of the, the policies that we looked at. Hiring policies we, we looked at. Um, and as we started having those, those conversations, we uh, really began to realize that there were a lot of policies that were in need of, of revision uh, with, with a, um, a, uh, with an equity frame behind them, um, but that that also we didn't really have a process for looking at those policies in an equitable way. And so we really began to change our focus to developing an equity lens 
through which we could examine the policies of of WSU. It was it was clear even before we began that one committee was not going to be looking at all of the policies of WSU and uh, addressing them through an equity lens. That That is work that is going to be ongoing for years and is beyond the scope of any one group. So we began to refocus that and think, so how do we develop something that can be used more broadly across WSU that will help us think about new policies um, through an equity lens and that will allow us as we revise our policies, which we do uh, or try to do every th three years, to be able to look at, at that through, uh, through new eyes, through an, equity, we, through an equity lens. So we took all of that work, we looked at what other institutions have done, we looked at what a lot of municipalities have done in uh, developing uh, equity mindedness in, in their communities. And we uh, applied that to what became known as our equity impact assessment tool. Um, we started by just applying it to a couple of policies and uh, seeing how it worked for the group. Um, as a result of that, we revised it substantially. Uh, and then over the summer, we got together as a group. It was one of our first face-to-face -face meetings after uh, of the, the start of our, our group. Actually, I think it was our first face-to-face -face meeting of, of our group. And we applied it to a series of other uh, policies within WSU. And once again, we, we revised it. And, and this, this iterative process became fundamental to... Uh, putting together what we're going to present to you in, in just a moment. Um, so we revised it multiple times within the group, and then we uh, brought it to cabinet in September. Uh, we revised it again after feedback from, from the cabinet. And um, then over the last um, uh, six weeks or so, and this is an ongoing process that will continue uh, through the beginning of, of January, as our work um, begins to, to wind down, we have shared it with various campus groups to get buy-in, to get feedback. Uh, we have shared with uh, ca each campus cabinet, with the Dean's Council, with the Faculty Senate, uh, and, and many other groups. Um, and so in, in this meeting that we had over the summer, um, we we met with Kirk and Elizabeth, and it became clear that the goal of our group was really to have a tool that could be integrated into all areas of the institution and used across WSU, and that that's where the work of this task force was going to have its uh, longest impact and and hopefully help to transform WSU as we look at things through through an equity lens. Uh, we we have made a number of revisions even recently. Obi will talk about those in in just a moment. Um, but now we'd really like to walk you through the the tool itself, the the questions, and then once uh, Obi has done that, happy to take any questions. But really, we'd love a conversation with with the regents about equity mindedness and um, addressing. Uh, the work that that uh, you all do, that we do as a community around uh, policy and, and equity. Obi. Great. Thank you, Mel. And, and thank you uh, all for the opportunity. It's an honor to be with you this morning. I uh, want to expand a bit on uh, what Mel named. And before we get into the questions, just uh, I think it's important to, to say that this process is not punitive as a tool. Um, we're often uh, placing equity and diversity on a deficit. And so I think it's important to name from the outset that this is not a punitive measure. Uh, this is not uh, deficit oriented, but intended to be facilitated, right? It's strengths based and a source of empowerment and an opportunity for transformation for uh, the campus. Um, I also think about this tool through the lens of capacity building, um, education, an opportunity to establish a common language for our campus, right? And to really embed equity in everything that we do across policy, practice, process, and also impacting people. 
It's also important to name that, uh, you know, Mel mentioned equity mindedness and our process was also rooted in theory as well as practice. And so it's important to note that equity mindedness in and of itself is a theory. Um, Estella Mata Bensmone's work informs equity mindedness. Uh, we'll probably get into some of the indicators of equity mindedness, but I think it's important to name those indicators as we go through uh, these questions, which really center around becoming systemically aware, right? We've heard uh, the, the term or the phrasing systemic racism, especially over the past couple of years, right? That is rooted in equity mindedness, right? Really connecting to and uh, dismantling and disrupting and engaging in conversations <laughs> about the social and, and historical uh, atrocities right, that, that bring us to conversations around systemic racism, uh, becoming institutionally focused, which again is what this uh, particular impact tool intends for us to do as not only a campus at WSU Vancouver, but across the WSU system. Uh, inclusive inquiry, which hopefully these questions uh, we believe uh, really encompass, right, the, this notion of um, inquiring inclusively, right, and thinking about that both qualitatively and quantitatively. Uh, there's also a piece of this about becoming race conscious, right, being willing to talk about race and lean in to conversations about race. Race is still one of the social taboos as relates to dialogue and, and conversations. And so there's a piece of this instrument where we are uh, looking through an intersectional lens, right, across uh, uh, social identities and historical underrepresentedness. And within that too, it's critical that we center race because when we look at any of our outcomes across the WSU system, we tend to see the greatest disparity as it relates to race, okay? And so race consciousness, um, and that, that's an empowerment term as opposed to uh, being viewed on the deficit. And finally, within the equity mindedness framework is to advance equity, right? And that's the goal uh, behind this, this assessment and the work that this group has been doing throughout uh, the, the, our, our, our time together, uh, which I agree has been quite enjoyable. There are a few other uh, frameworks that uh, lend to this work around microaggressions. We'll talk a bit about intent versus impact, but it's important to note that microaggressions too is a theoretical and practical framework rooted in the works of um, Daryl Wing Su, uh, Solarsano, Chester Pierce, uh, who's the founder of microaggressions. And then the final piece that I would say that we spent a lot of time on as a group is the work of Timas and Oaken, who um, produced some really great research about the reproduction of, of the status quo power and privilege at historically under at historically white and predominantly white institutions right and really thinking about the decisions and the practices that we uh, that that we produce and that we make and how that reproduces uh, a culture and a system of whiteness at campuses like ours and so i want to provide that context as we're going through each of the questions uh, and i also want you to think about what are some policies that uh, perhaps you are working on, what are some uh, practices, what are some decisions that are at your doorstep currently, right? It could be, uh, you know, EP12, which we spent time on, equal opportunity, EP35, which was around space allocation, or even my favorite, EP5, the policy on policies. Uh, and so who would have thought there's a policy on policies? I love that. Uh, and so if we uh, begin with uh, question one, and, and we really thought about this through the lens of development of, um, you know, thinking about new policies as well as if we were reviewing existing policies. So uh, the first one is have WSU community members from communities that have experienced systemic racism and institutional discrimination been intentionally involved in the process of drafting this policy, practice, or decision? If not, who else should be involved in the development process? And then looking at this through the lens of revision, right? were WSU community members from communities that have experienced systemic racism and institutional discrimination 
intentionally involved in the process of reviewing this policy practice or decision? And if not, who should be involved in the revision process, right? And so this is really an opportunity to look around spaces such as these, right? These are critically powerful, right, spaces. These are tables of power. And so just beginning with that question, right, interrupts the status quo, interrupts our process as usual of making decisions, right? Who is here and who should be here? Who have we consulted with, okay? Um, the next question, what are the intended outcomes of the policy practice or decision? And then I'm also going to go to number three in this because it gets to that notion again of intent and impact, right? So then number three, what are the potential impacts of this policy practice or decision, right, on those who have experienced systemic racism and institutional discrimination? Okay, and then there are some sub questions within three, and that is intended. And, and I should also say that this process is sequential, right? And so we're going to go through all six of these questions, right, as we're preparing to engage in development of uh, processes, policies, decision making, and ratifying those decisions, policies, and processes, right? And so again, uh, how might this policy have a disproportionate impact? both negatively and positively on those who have experienced systemic racism and institutional discrimination? And how does this policy practice or decision perpetuate, right? Or help to dismantle historical or other barriers to equity, right? And so there's a piece of this too, when we look at uh, the framework around microaggressions, which talks quite a bit about intent versus impact. Right. Um, oftentimes we spend uh, quite a bit of time on, well, my intention was this. Right. But we really don't talk as much about the impact. Right. How this impacted our community, how this hurt, how this helped. Right. And so just going into this process with the intention, OK, with the intention to expand equity, with the intention to embed and infuse equity throughout the fabric of our campuses. Right. That minimizes the adverse impacts. Right. Right. The possibility of the adverse impact. Just having the intention. Just having the intention. OK. Um, and then number four, if this policy practice or decision has the potential to ignore or worsen existing disparities. Right. And so this is picking up a bit on uh, on the on the uh, question above. Right. If this policy practice or decision has the potential to ignore or worsen existing disparities or produce other unintended consequences, should it be enacted, right? And if so, what mitigation should be planned? This is probably one of my favorite questions uh, of, the, of the group because of that clause, should this policy be enacted, right? Right. We've spent time and, and we recognize that there's space here that we may be reproducing the status quo. We may be engaging in uh, the, the reproduction of systemic inequities. Do we ratify, do we adopt this policy or process anyhow? And if we say no, then okay, right? Now what do we do? What is the strategy now, all right? Um, how does the implementation how does the implementation and communication of this policy practice or decision align with WSU's commitment to equity? And then there was a recent revision that we received uh, that I think is is very much aligned with this question still. What accountability infrastructure and resources are required to implement this policy practice or decision? Right. And accountability, uh, I, I think, is absolutely uh, ingrained in the work that we do as it relates to equity, diversity and inclusion. Those of us who have that squarely in our portfolios. Uh, but accountability has also become uh, a really important term over these past couple of years. Right. When we think about, as Mel mentioned, the the killing, the murder of George Floyd. Um, at, at the time of his death and the uh, incarceration of the ex-officer uh, who killed him, accountability became the, the buzz, the buzz term. And so there's a piece of this of how do we move beyond 
the, the buzzwords and really ingrain and embed accountability into our work for equity, diversity, and inclusion, right? And alongside that, belonging, justice, and love, okay? And uh, number six, what is the plan? What is the plan to evaluate and monitor this policy, this practice, or decision to ensure equity both in the short and in the long term? And again, this speaks to that notion of um, accountability, embedding equity into the framework of WSU across the system, uh, infrastructure, and really setting up this work for success, right? Those resources are absolutely critical, right? Um, there's another piece too that I just want to dissect for a moment, and that is around uh, policy, <clears throat> which we've named here, but also we've talked quite a bit about uh, practice and decision-making. And so policy is very much ingrained into this particular uh, strategy and tool, but it's also important to name our everyday decision-making that we engage in. For example, we're in the process of um, our next iteration of the strategic plan at WSU Vancouver and as, as well as the system, right? What would it look like if we took a moment to engage in these <clears throat> assessment questions for equity impact, right? Uh, we're gonna have the groundbreaking soon around the life sciences building, which is so exciting. And we've been talking quite a bit about naming opportunities and uh, the vibrancy and creating vibrancy on our campus. It's gonna be critical that we engage in this process, right? And so these are things that go, uh, that, that speak to policy, but also speak to our everyday decisions and the opportunities for us to interrupt our implicit biases, right, our unconscious biases, okay, and really to in embed and to engage equity in a beyond the performative, but in really meaningful and authentic uh, ways. And so I, I am just thrilled to be able to work with our chancellor on this and all of our colleagues uh, in this space and really look forward to hearing from each of you as, as to how you could see uh, embedding this in your everyday uh, efforts, right, for equity, and then uh, how we may do that here at WSU uh, as a system as well as uh, our campus. Thanks, Obi. And let me just uh, give one one more example. I think the, the last point that Obi was making uh, really uh, was important to the committee. Uh, we can have a policy on hiring and that policy, we can look at that through an equity lens. As we were talking about that though, we also noted that there are a lot of procedures around hiring, putting together a search committee and many search committees just reproduce themselves. And so it wasn't just the policy, it had to be the way that we enact those policies and, and realize those, those policies um, through the procedures that, that we use that also need to go through this equity lens. And once you get there, as we begin to think about decisions that, that we're making in, in this space, um, for this to be utilized more broadly, um, just thinking about the decisions that we make on a regular basis through an equity lens became really important. So I'm very glad that, that we're, we're sort of ending our little presentation at, at that point. Um, now we would throw it open um, to the regions for any questions that you might have for us, but also really for a, a conversation um, around uh, this this work and the importance of this work to WSU. I'll just sort of start. Um, thank you to the team for all the hard work on this, and you've really come up with some some really good questions to ask. You know, whenever a policy is set. Um, one of the things that I was sort of wondering when we go through this, I was trying to think of policies that need to be changed, and hiring is, is an obvious one, you know, that we've actually talked about in the past. How, how are you going to sort of sort through the policies, and there's many policies that already exist, to try to prioritize those that need to be um, Put through this lens first, um, and because I'm—I mean, I know we will we'll likely do it with um, new policies, but there's probably a lot of other ones out there 
that um, need that revision as well? Uh, yes, that is a great question. And and one of one thing that I should have said is that um, we have um, recommendations that we are working on now that we will finalize and send to the president and the provost. Um, and um, one of those recommendations will be around uh, the, the policy on policies requires a three year review. But some of our policies haven't been reviewed in decades. Um, and and so um, the one of our recommendations is that we become more systematic in reviewing those policies so that every one of our policies is going through this process every three years and and that we're we're holding true to the policy that uh, mandates that that we do that. I think there are um, other pieces to that as well. Uh, and 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 I want to be clear that, um, this is not brand new being uh, introduced to WSU for the first time ever. Uh, our student affairs office on our campus in Pullman, they are looking at student processes, student policies through an equity lens every single day. That is uh, paramount in, in the work that, that is happening. There are many places on, uh, across all of our campuses where this is already happening. Um, what we really want to do is institutionalize it across WSU, and that requires us to, I think, become more systematic in reviewing the policies that we have. So this would become a core piece within the policy on policies? <laughs> Danielle is, is nodding vigorously. Yeah. Yes, that is also one of the recommendations that we are making uh, from our, our committee. I, I apologize. I'm hesitant to just blurt out the recommendations because the president and the provost haven't seen them yet. And so um, I, I think the but but as they're they're related, I'm happy to talk about them. So a uh, question on this um, revision of existing policies piece. Um, when you look at the uh, revision, will you be looking at just the revised portions or you'd be looking at the entire policy? Your answer to the last question seemed to imply that now all policies will ultimately go through this lens, but they'll go through the lens from the very bottom of the policy, you know, top to bottom, not just like, okay, what are we tweaking here? And is this comma going to have an impact uh, on equity? That would be our hope. Okay. And can I add to that? Um, We've also talked about what would it look like to have a before and after, right? So that community me community members would know what exactly was changed or updated per that policy. Um, There's some great um, uh, examples of this at, at other universities who have implemented and formalized or institutionalized an equity lens where they show the before and show the after for the impact. And uh, follow up on that, um, like what about a budget? Uh, you know, so this is policies. I'm trying to think of what's a policy practice or decision versus what's kind of a structural element of the university or a, uh, you know, kind of a, a assumption. You know, we sort of have, we, we have an institution. <laughs> and so the institution exists and then there are sort of, um, it's almost like uh, if you think about a building, this would be sort of like the the furniture and the and the uh, the the repainting and the um, you know the the renovation of this wing or something like that. But the basic, like we have this land that these buildings sit on and all these people doing their thing, we're not looking at that, are we? Or is this? I mean, I'm trying to figure out how deep does this go. Well, I think I, I, I think that it does go that deeply, right? If we're really looking at, and I, and I think it's important to name as we show up here in the homeland of the Chinookan and Titan upon peoples and the Cowlitz Indian tribe, right? That we are engaging in a process of if it if it is about furniture or what have you, you know, there there is a structural piece of that. And I think it's important how you named the, the structural nature of our existing and how we're coming here today working um, and being on indigenous soils. And so I think just as a, a, an homage and a respect to um, our ancestors in that way, going through this process, it is 
uh, critical, but then uh, just from a, a strategic and, and institutional strategic uh, lens, right? If we're really embedding equity uh, throughout the WSU system and the fabric of, of campus and going through this exercise, we have to begin to look at it as it's not an exercise. It's really a, a strategy, right? A formalized strategy and how we make decisions, how we produce policies and how we formalize practices um, across our campuses and, and system. Yeah, I, I would completely agree with that. And, and I would just add that uh, budgets can have disproportionate impacts right. on people. Our, our presentation that we're going to be doing next is uh, about the dis uh, disparate impact of COVID, in part, the disparate impact of COVID on our women faculty and faculty of color. Uh, I think all of these things, and 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 I'm I'm so proud to say that the um, on their own and with um, my colleagues at WSU Vancouver, that this building that we're going to be doing the groundbreaking on today, every step of the way, we have been applying an equity lens to the decisions that we've been making and asking and pushing the architects to consider equity as they are considering everything from flow through the building to what the artwork is going to look like in the building to uh, how accessible the building is. And, and so I do think that this is a literally ground up, um, it, it's ground up important for D WSU. Uh, and, and that's why we've, uh, it, it's, it's odd because our task was policy, that's in our charge, but the, the matter of equity is universal. It's not just policy. And so we're trying to capture that in this tool in a way that makes its use much broader um, than, than just policy. Um. Shane oh, just had it, then we'll go to Matt. Yes, thanks. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to be calling on people. No, it's good. I just <laughs> wanted to make sure Shane's had his hand up thanks. for a little bit. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. Um, and so one of them is just looking at that WCU community members and wondering um, who you're envisioning in that, because even that can be um, subjective, right? So if we're thinking about current students, for example, versus who is in our community and remembering our land grant um, foundation, and that who is a current student might not be reflective of the community that we're hoping to serve or striving to serve. So I'm just thinking, keeping that in mind. One question, I, I love these questions. I think these are really great and thank you for um, presenting today and for, for sharing this with us. And then I'm finding myself reading these questions and reflecting back on this as a tool and asking these questions of the tool even. So for example, <laughs> number six, what is the plan to evaluate and monitor the policy practice or decision? Can you talk about what, um, what you would envision for this policy or for this impact tool and moving forward and how to continue to, to revisit that and not let it just become stagnant? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's good. That, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, that, that, that is uh, hugely important for all of this work. If it becomes static, then we have failed. And, and that's part of why we have um, why we're making recommendations on the policy on policies to make sure that we are coming back to revisit this policy um, on on a regular basis. I, um, you know, in June, August, when we were kind of using this, I think we felt like we had something that was great. It was done. That, that we we had this, and as we began consulting with people, we got incredible ideas and incredible feedback on on this. People asked um, really excellent questions. And so where one of the reasons we don't actually have recommendations today is because we have spent our meetings this semester coming back to this tool and and thinking, are these the right words? Um, we know that it is not perfect. We would like to say that it will never be perfect because um, it, uh, the, the, the world changes and we need a, a document that, that changes with it. And we, we need a process in place, which is, is something that we're still really 
thinking about and have to discuss with with the president. How does this work get get carried forward with the leaders on all of our campuses, with our system leaders to continue to come back to to not to continue to come back to it, to always stay with with this work. Thank you. And I'll just briefly ask my second question because you kind of touched on it even there was you're talking about accountability and um, that being a buzzword or 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 so. And I'm but I am wondering um, who takes responsibility for this, for asking these questions um, and question again, coming back to your great questions and how this um, might impact your staff and faculty of color more predominantly than white staff um, and that mental and emotional labor and then just thinking about that compensation as well. So just something to be that I'm thinking of in reflection of these questions. That's good. Yeah, I think that's a, a, an important point. Um, you know, and, and as it relates to responsibility, we all have a responsibility, right? And so again, when we look at uh, <laughs> tables such as these, that we're all a part of these tables of power, right? We have a responsibility to engage in this process and to really center it as a bona fide strategy as, as opposed to uh, a reaction, right? And, and to be existing as a, an afterthought, right? And so it's this notion of this, this uh, equity lens can't be like a light switch where we have the option of turning it on or off. It always needs to be on. Right, and so we all have that responsibility. I do think that uh, the question as it relates to intensified harm um, for historically underrepresented and excluded groups, including black, brown, indigenous, and uh, people of color uh, is an important one. And it is one that we have engaged as, as a community, as, as a, a task force. There's a, a, a piece in that too that not to answer with another question, but what is also the cost of silence and or going about business as usual? Is our current process working for us, right? Is our current process not reproducing still, right? Systemic inequities across historical and historically underrepresented groups. Are we still not seeing the greatest disparity across race? Uh, per faculty, staff, and students with the process that we are using currently, right? And so there's a piece of this work when we think about equity, diversity, and inclusion. And that's why I wanted to open it up to say that this is not punitive, right? But it may feel like a risk because we've not engaged in this process before, right? But if we're really looking at embedding this work, we have to consider how we're showing up in our own mindsets and how tools like these can serve as an interrupter, right? As a disruptor to business as usual, right? And so I, I, I love uh, that question, Regent, right? And I, I think that um, it's one that we have to continue to, to grapple with throughout any of these processes. And the other piece about this instrument is that these questions will evolve. Right, the work around equity, diversity and inclusion, belonging, justice evolves, right? And it's important that we um, evolve with it. And so these questions may, may shift over time. And as Mel mentioned, the, uh, you know, the recommendations that, that we have yet to present to the, the president and provost, I, I think will also uh, speak to that a bit, right? And so, uh, I, I, that's a, a great, great question. Thank you. Thank you. I'll go to Jeanette and then to Ron. Okay, thanks. Um, maybe Lisa building too. on Shanine, And then Lisa. Um, first, I'd like to compliment you for all the work and President Schultz for setting the tone because I think that's an important aspect of all of this is, you know, you're addressing the um, institutionalization, but there's also a huge opportunity to affect the culture long term. And what does that mean? That means empowering everyone. And as I was looking at the tool, um, it, I sort of reacted to it as it's, it's very analog. And one way to go about spreading to a more plural system is uh, you know, how are you going to modernize that and engage everyone? And there might be a huge opportunity to really expand the tool um, in a simple way 
um, with the why and the explanation and the aspiration added to the framework so that everybody in the system participates, not just the policymakers. So imagine, um, you know, with the student body, with the faculty pushing it out as a, um, you know, a modern index of uh, questions with all the explanations behind it in the framework. That was my reaction. I, I would just compliment you on the work. And I think that um, speed is important. Culture is important. Um, and you want to, you know, I worry about getting bogged down and making it um, check the box bureaucracy. So how do you capture this? Humanize it a little bit. Yeah. And and then the stories will follow. Mm -hmm. So then you attach stories and you st attach data. Um, so I'm just blowing it up as a system in my mind anyway. Um, but I really appreciate all the work that you're doing and um, see a lot of potential. Thanks. Thank you. Thank Great you. feedback. Thank you. Regent Sims. The um, I think, uh, I, mean, I, I respect your work. I think it's just fantastic what you're doing and, and how you're doing it. I think it would be also uh, easy for you to go into places that uh, and ask them what they're doing as well. For instance, uh, Bill Gates came out with one really strong statement three days ago on systemic racism. It was blunt. It was brutal, and he was talking about why it and why it needs to end, particularly because it was affecting. He wanted to be. He's in a competitive environment. He's trying to get the best here, and he is finding that racism gets in the way. So I think talking to a person like uh, uh, going, if you need to get in there, my neighbor is a longtime Gates person. It was she was used to be the next door neighbor. And she still works for the company, but she has the same feelings that we don't, nobody ever gets, we don't know where to get people who actually understand this issue before they're in the company. And what you're doing is you're creating an environment that makes it very attractive for Washington State University students to be hired in those companies because they have to compete in a multiracial world and they want to get talent from a multiracial world and they want managers that can understand that issue. They don't want to, you know, Sam Smith, who was a mentor to many of us, used to say, I hate educating them. Uh, and it was his way of talking about how stupid racism was and why it was a waste of time for many of us of color to spend our time talking to a person about something they did and its repercussions. What you're doing is you're doing that much earlier in a higher ed environment so they don't have to be retrained after they leave here. Uh, so I think talking to a, uh, a uh, somebody at the Gates Foundation uh, and telling them what you're doing with your students would be a door opener for Washington State University students because you're gonna say, Washington State University students are prepared for this. Um, if you have a problem, let me know. But I think don't, it's just not a WSU issue. Uh, it really isn't. I'm multi, I, I'm, my wife is, is from the Philippines and Lord, I can tell you, it gets to be rough out there when I, because people are saying, well, she's, why would she marry a black or why would a black marry a Filipino? I, said, I don't know. I fell in love with her. I just, <laughs> we don't know. We, we didn't understand all those other rules, but our kids are impacted by it. Mm -hmm. And I'm too old to put up with it. So I get shorthanded sometimes when I say to them, you know, hold a second. Yeah, they're proud of their multiracial being in a multiracial family. But I love the work you're doing because it has so much potential and it makes old people like me optimistic <laughs> about the fact that you have the capacity more than you think to alter social systems that are old and antiquated and need to be crushed uh, in a highly competitive world. So I just love what you're doing and I hope I can persuade you to come to Seattle so I can get you into Microsoft so you can talk to Bill Gates because he realized Microsoft's entire future is going to be based on having people who understand multicultural and multiracial environments. 
I, I'm helping. I have attention to my speech. I'm just <laughs> begging you. you to come to Seattle. And yeah, do that. Th thank you. And also, um, th that that statement is huge, and we would absolutely take you up on that offer. There have been other moments of hope. The when the governor released uh, the requirements for the budget request, it was all built around equity, yeah. and we borrowed that language in earlier versions of this document. Some of it is still there. And we had basically a whole committee meeting where we discussed this document that the governor had put out about the importance of equity in, in our state. And so those moments do do give us hope. Uh, and, and they also uh, realize the importance that this is much bigger than one campus or higher ed, that this is uh, a bigger issue. Regent Chow. Regent Sims is hard to follow. Um, so I agree we need to, to crush racism. And um, I am so proud of the work that WSU Vancouver in particular is not only doing with students and faculty here on this campus, but within our community. And hopeful that you'll talk a little about pace and base, because I think that the, the reach of the equity work that's being done here, extends well beyond WSU um, into uh, professional boardrooms, so, into like to, you know, community yeah. spaces. Oh, and so yeah, just, um, one of the things that, as I listened to the presentation and I think about the charge that you had, which was around policy, which certainly disrupting systemic racism and institutional discrimination at the policy level is just so important. There's been other comments about where else this reaches. And so this may actually be a question for our president, um, but I'm, I'm concerned about um, one of the real tangible tools that we have um, is around how we spend our money. So how does this sort of equity impact assessment relate to our budget models? Um, so, I mean, when we think about, let's say that we can solve all of our policies, which is a daunting task, are we doing that with the resources that we currently have and asking them to do more? Are we dedicating resources to make this a priority? And are we utilizing the same kind of assessment throughout our entire you know, uh, overall WSU structure to uh, Regent Redmond's comment about, you know, even just the spaces. So um, my question may not be directed at this end of the table, but rather at this end of the table relative to just how do we take this um, really good work and leverage it throughout the entire system? And I was trying to find, and I just can't find it easily, but I believe in one of um, your goals President Schultz, it's around kind of a president's commission, um, if I recall correctly. And so I'm just curious, maybe not in this space or at this time, but I'd like to better understand how this fits with your strategic approach and how we can fold in the financial resources um, to be able to, to support the work. Because um, to Regent Wright's comment, this kind of um, real meaningful work doesn't live on unless we financially invest in ensuring it lives on beyond one committee. So that would be. Thank you. Um, just, I, oddly, I, and not that I carry him with me all the time, but I have his goals here. So it does, yeah. um, he's, he <laughs> updates us on that. And there is a presidential commission um, as part of his goal. So um, I'm going to turn it to President Schultz. I, I just would um, say a couple things in what I'm hearing from everybody. So, um, to Regent Wright's questions um, around accountability. Um, coming from the private sector, if we have a strategy and we are looking to put in a new process and we are look, looking to shift culture, um, we attach metrics, we attach accountability in a very real way. And so as we start to look at how you want to, um, in particular, if you are needing and wanting and to make this go and have a financial component tied to it, I believe that you have to, and you're probably already doing this under your recommendations, have a very clear set of criteria and measurements in which you're holding all of us accountable to. Because um, I think the questions are amazing. I think they could actually be shared with the private sector um, and WSU could lead an interesting uh, path for the private sector who, quite frankly, just doesn't even know 
doesn't have a clue on how to dig into this, right? They pretend, but we just don't know. We don't have, quite frankly, some of the um, really good brain power behind this and context. And, and a lot of uh, the private sector doesn't have the diversity to actually get different perspective. Um, so I think WSU has a wonderful opportunity here. And to Jeanette's point, I would say, um, find a way to humanize this and uh, make it super succinct so that it just becomes something that we are all rattling off. Like what are the three things that we should be saying in every single meeting when we're looking at a future action item? Um, how do I learn to be better at that? Um, so as a region, I, I love the concept. I'm very, very appreciative of the work you've done. As a region, I would ask, what are the metrics? What comes next to hold all of us accountable to ensuring this goes forward. Thanks. Um, we'll give Kirk the, the last word, but just one one last thing. Uh, the uh, tomorrow, um, when I get my opportunity to to speak at the board meeting, uh, Obi and uh, Narek Danielian will be talking about specifically about the things that you're asking. Okay. How do we push this work out into the community? So we will follow up uh, with you. Yeah. In, in the morning. Well done. Can well I, done. Before and, Chris can yeah, make okay. one comment. I have no last word. I just have <laughs> comments. <laughs> anyway, whatever. It doesn't matter. But I know we need to move yeah. on to the next presentation. I'll wrap it up. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I, I, just one thing <laughs> is that is that I really appreciate all of this, and I think it's great, and uh, I know it's really tough stuff. Um, I, the only thing I feel in sitting through this, I don't know how many times I've sat through things like this. But why has it taken so long? <laughs> that really just bugs me. You know, I mean, talk about age. Ron is older than me, by the way. <laughs> but um, <laughs> uh, anyway, I just I, I I get very frustrated that it's taken so long in my life. You know, that we're we're talking about stuff like. That. That's all I have to say. It's a very fair yeah. question. And, and if I could also offer. Uh, campus, WSU Vancouver, we uh, had have proposed an equity lens years ago, uh, and there are a number of groups. Uh, Regent Shower named one, um, our base, uh, base committee, uh, building a community of equity. We've been engaged in the work of an equity lens from the outset of my tenure, which began back in 2017. Um, and there are plenty other groups and committees and councils, as our chancellor alluded to, that has been engaged in the work. Uh, but Agreed, 100%, uh, right? Um, why has it taken so long? Can I just make one last comment? Um, that in the time that I've been on the board, um, this table, which is of power and privilege here, has changed. And so I do wanna say that um, there is already shifts happening and I'm incredibly proud of that. There's more but work But then I gotta say, why did that take so long? Right. Well, I don't disagree, but I do want to celebrate where we have, where we are moving towards, which is um, a different look and feel. Right. And there's always more, so ever evolving, right? Ever evolving. Okay. Can you bring it home for us? <laughs> sure. Um, <laughs> first, uh, Mel, and to your team and everybody, thank you for this work because it's hard work. And uh, I do appreciate it. I know we got a lot of people in the room that have been very involved and engaged with it. Um, I was reflecting, uh, and I think I told Mel this earlier, that <clears throat> every year when I do reviews of most of the people in the room, um, people have to submit three kind of key areas that they want to work on next year, whether they're chancellor or vice president. And if I go back a couple years ago, a couple people would have in their top three mentioned uh, diversity, equity, and inclusive excellence. This last year, everybody put that in there, not, and this is, goes back to Shane, to your question, not because I told everybody to put it in. People said, this needs to be part of what I'm doing, whether it's in fundraising, whether it's my campus, whether it's my particular area. So one of the things I think when we talk about, are we going to be able to sustain this, is I think it's gone to a point where it's a integral part of what our leaders are asking about how to do in their particular areas and units. And so, Mel, we had some early discussions about what the outcome might be. And I thought it was really important to get a tool because it can feel like a check the box. But I would argue 
that if we start doing the check the box, people are going to want to learn more. They're going to want to do it more, that we will have moved from a group doing it to everybody starting to look at it in this particular way along the journey. And every group within campuses, WC Vancouver is much more advanced and mature in some of this space than we are in other places, but we're all moving. And I think that says a lot about where we're going. Um, Ron, your, uh, your comment about the graduates, I was meeting with, let's just say a person on the fairly right side of the political spectrum in my office. And we were asking them to invest in a new engineering facility. They live in a different state. And this came up um, because they were very concerned that we were, indoctrinating students or whatever the favorite things that you read. And I told him, I said, our job as a higher education institution is to prepare graduates to be successful in a diverse workplace so that you don't have to do that when they're there. And, you know, it's funny. He said, I kind of didn't think about it that way. And instead of getting hung up on, you know, CRT or whatever, to me, it's you ought to expect a Washington State graduate, whether it's Houston, Texas, Seattle, Washington, East Coast, that you can put them in a room with a diverse set of individuals and they are culturally sensitive to be able to work with those individuals to solve problems because that's why you're hiring them. And I think we got to keep our focus on that's really what we're trying to do. Um, the budget questions are really relevant because we can do all this fantastic work, identify areas of concern and go, well, we don't have the money. And then it kind of stops. Um, we're working on a new budget model. Stacy and Elizabeth will be ready to talk with the regents about this because it's not just tweaking around the edges. It's a reset of how do we budget money at Washington State University in a reasonable sense that anybody can sit down 10 minutes and go, okay, I got the general viewpoint of why money goes and which particular places, and there's some rationale to it. These are the types of things as you build that, you say, we need to build these kind of particular pools of resources into that. So when we identify something, we don't go, well, we, we know it's a problem, we can't really do anything about it, that we start building that in as part of our future budget. Um, then the final thing, and again, we can't plan forever. You know, to me, you get to 90% sometimes, you say, we're gonna go and execute, and then we tweak it along the way. And I think that's an important part because we could spend another six months tweaking the questions and all that. At some point, you gotta just start using it and going, okay, here's a whole, Here's what works. Here's what doesn't. So <clears throat> I think it's hard to land that plane sometimes because people always want to improve it a little bit. We just got to use it and we'll come back after a year and go, wow, this really worked extremely well. This was one that we just didn't quite have this right. And we got to be willing to kind of change on the fly. And so I appreciate it's a great set of it's a great tool, great set of questions. Uh, will it cause some uh, disruption? Yes, but it needs to. And uh, I think it's going to cause it in a positive way. So I'm proud of the work. Thank you all for the people been involved. And as regents, this is the purpose of these morning sessions on Thursdays is to not do something in 10 minutes, have two questions, and then we bolt. So it's, it's good to be able to spend an hour on something. And actually, we want to continue to have this dialogue. So it's a great dialogue. Yeah. I have one quick question as it pertains to this. And I'm sorry, I didn't catch exactly who was involved um, in the committee structure of this. But um, I think, you know, our medical school has done a very, very nice job of really trying to dig in and understand, yeah. you know, what we can be doing from an equity standpoint, um, as well as a diverse standpoint, because it's so important from the healthcare de delivery side of things. So are, is that an engagement that we have representation? Oh, OK. Thank you, Dr. Liker. So, OK. Thank and you. she will be up. <laughs> She's coming up next. Oh, so I've, just pro off. I've just teased her. Uh, on, yeah. So, OK. Um, I, we're going to take a quick break. I want to also recognize that we have Regent John Shetler, who is um, I'm sorry that I missed him this morning as we were doing introductions. So good morning. Good morning, John. Good to see you, John. Have any questions? Do you have any questions or any comments that you would like to share here? Many of them were, were raised. Uh, the biggest thing for me, uh, though, is how do we measure success and how do we hold ourselves accountable? And I'm sure that that's all linked into the policies that uh, I look forward to working with the uh, team and the committee in the you know coming months and years ahead to ensure that we succeed in this area. Good. Thank you.
Regent yeah. Shetler. Okay, um, it is about 10.05 here. We're going to break. We'll reconvene at 10.20 um, and uh, get to get into our next presentation, which is equity in research. And so we're very excited to have you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, yeah.
like Kyle between oh, well, I'm glad I asked because uh, <laughs> well, it might be just the machine and like you want to go longer well, but, you know, well, I'm worried about having the Supreme Court uh, do it now. right get it done they didn't get it done but you know what the problem is I mean, you know, like, like, they were set up for failure with it getting a burn. But so I like, totally, yeah, and I'm not a coffee snob, but yeah, yeah, still, but yeah, you know, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I just, yeah. Oh, so you know. So I know a little bit. Yeah. 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 It's been a while. Yeah. Um, okay, we are calling um, our regent meeting back to order. So we'll go ahead and get our past chair and our president to come sit down. Des <laughs> <laughs> is on it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Des. <laughs> All right. Um, I did want to quickly introduce the two most important people actually at our meeting that they were behind me making sure everything happens. We wouldn't all be here actually if it weren't for the superstars of Des, Desiree Jacobson and Mary Jenkins. So thank you. Thank you. Lots of coordination goes into this, and if anybody's ever been under the ruling of Des, you, you know what that means. So, <laughs> Okay. Um, we are moving on now to our um, discussion and presentation on equity in research, and we are um, really fortunate to be joined. Just get be patient with me because I think this is worthy of sharing some of this. Um, with Dr. Christine Portforce who's a professor of the School of Biological Sciences and the Vice Chancellor for Research and Graduate Education at Washington State University, Vancouver, and Tri-Cities. Her research focuses on the neural and molecular mechanisms underlying hearing loss and communication disorders using bats as a model system. Her captive colony of bats at WSU Vancouver provides unique opportunities for undergraduate students to gain valuable research experiences. We are also joined by Dr. Um, Celestina Barboza Liker, who is an associate professor in the College of Nursing and vice chancellor for research at Washington State University Health Sciences, Spokane. Her research focuses on substance use over the lifespan, and she is currently leading an interdisciplinary research team to assess mothers, infants, and healthcare providers in order to care for women with opioid use disorders, as well as for women using cannabis during pregnancy. So I'm not sure that you get more impressive individuals as you two. We are just honored that you're here. So thank you. Great. Thank you so much. And thank you for inviting us to give this presentation today. Um, clearly, what Celestine and I are going to be talking about follows quite nicely from the presentation from earlier this morning. And as I was sitting there listening to Mel and Obi talk and then the conversations with the regents, I'm thinking, oh, I need to change how I introduce what we talk about because this thread fits with what we're gonna be saying and this thread and this thread. So it's really, I think, fabulous that we're spending two hours talking about equity, equity issues, and what Celestine and I are gonna be talking about, some inequities that are present in not just the research mission at WSU, but also nationally, and how some of those have been significantly impacted by this pandemic that we're living in. And these impacts, as uh, Celestina will talk about a little bit later, are not just from 2020 and 2021, but they are long-term impacts on some of our research faculty and our graduate students and our postdocs and, of course, our undergraduate <coughs> students. And so we just felt that it's very important for all of you to understand what is happening within the research world also, what is happening within WSU to try to mitigate some of these inequities? And certainly this toolkit that Mel and Obi presented um, relate to the research mission, not only with hiring, but how we allocate research space and dollars for support, et cetera. Um, so there are so many overlapping issues between what we talked about earlier this morning and what Celestine and I are going to present. We also want to make sure that there's time <clears throat> at the end of our presentation to have a discussion around some of the things that you are doing in your different organizations to mitigate some, in particular, some of the gender inequities that might be present 
and also some of the racial inequities that might be present. So what we're going to talk about today, just really briefly, is to help you understand research inequities both nationally and at WSU, to understand how the COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated these inequities, to understand what WSU is doing and mitigate some of them, and then hopefully to have a discussion to share strategies. So this is what you can be thinking about as we're presenting. What are trends that you're seeing in your workplace? What are you doing to support gender and racial equity within your own organizations? And then help us brainstorm about things that WSU can be doing to help move further along with our equity mission. So some of this stems from some data that you, I don't know if all of you saw it or just a subcommittee, but um, was presented at the May Board of Regents meeting by Vice President of, President of Research Chris Keen. And what he shared is that at WSU, the tenure or tenure track women faculty have fewer awards, so research awards and are less often the lead principal investigator compared to their percentage of faculty. So what this table shows, this is from 19, 2019 data, and you can see here that we have the professor category, associate professor, and then assistant professor. These are the number of faculty in, in all of those categories. These are the number of lead PIs in those different categories. And then we have the number of wards. This circled column is the percentage of female faculty as full professors. And you'll see that there are 26.8% of WSU full professors who are female. At the associate level, 38.7% of our faculty are female, and at the assistant professor level, 47.9% are female. So this provides an indication right here that at the rank where people are hired in their first faculty position, the assistant level, level professor, we're doing pretty good around equity. We have almost 50% female and male uh, faculty members. But as you go higher up in the ranks, that changes quite significantly. So at the associate level, we have about 39%, but then at that full professor level, it is only about a quarter of our, of our female, of only a quarter of the faculty who are professors are female. Then when you look at the percentage of female faculty member, members who are holding grant awards, it is even less than the percentage of female faculty in that category. So if we go back to the assistant level professors, of the 47.9% female faculty assistant professors, only 34% are lead principal investigators on grants. The associate professor, 30%, and at the full professor, 16%. So Chris presented this. And there was a little bit of a discussion afterwards. And Celestina and I then thought we should really present a more full data set for you all to really think through this and understand what's happening at WSU. So our takeaways, at the assistant level professor, we're pretty close to being equal men and women. At associate and full professors, there's an imbalance of men and women faculty members and that women have relatively fewer awards and are less often lead PI compared to the, their percentage of faculty. So what does this mean? This means that we have to make sure our women faculty are being promoted and retained as often as our male faculty. And we need to find ways to help women faculty be more successful grant awardees that, and lead PIs. Now you have to understand that we are not going delving down into this data to look at disciplines and there may, there may be reasons why some of these disparities exist that are not just about gender inequity, but there are significant gender inequities nationwide that are <clears throat> probably also prevalent at WSU. So we wanna spend a little bit of time talking about what some of those national data show. 
For example, in biomedical science disciplines, there continues to be an underrepresentation under of women faculty members as you proceed through the ranks. And this is really interesting because if you look at women in undergraduate science programs, biology, for example, on our campus, and I think this is true in Pullman too, that there's actually a higher percentage of women undergraduate students in some science programs than men. In 2000, that should be 2015, not 2105, um, <laughs> women earned, because I don't know what's gonna happen in 2105. <laughs> it might look the same. In 2015, <laughs> women, uh, women earned more than half of the PhDs awarded in biology, 53%. Okay, this is nationwide. They comprised then 48% of all the postdocs in biology. So you get your PhD in biology and you pretty much can't go right into a university profession. You have to go into what's called a postdoctoral position where you work in somebody else's lab, get more training before you become an assistant professor. At the assistant professor level, women comp comprise 44%. At the professor level, 35%. Okay, so you can see that there is this attrition that's happening from the graduate student level to the full professor level. And we know from data from numerous studies, that's for a number of reasons. It's because um, there's dropout, that from PhD student to postdoc, those are often in childbearing years. Women sometimes choose to not pursue their degree or, or their um, academic career path. From the assistant professor to the associate and then the full professor, as Laura told me today, we have really good rates, comparable rates of women and men being tenured and promoted but women, for example, are staying at the associate level professor rank longer than their male counterparts. And some of those reasons are because they have children and they take extensions in their timeline, because they have more service responsibilities, because they get put in leadership positions, which impacts their research and teaching and progress towards tenure. Um, so there are a number of factors. But there is also the factor of discrimination that is still very prevalent, that every female scientist who I think I have ever spoken to, you know, us included, could tell you horror stories of what it's like to be a woman in science, from sexual discrimination to being at a poster session, presenting your work, and instead of the person who you're talking to asking you the question, they ask your male supervisor. It's like, they don't know, they didn't do the work. So there are all sorts of reasons, differences in space allocation. Um, so lots of reasons that lots of people have, have done studies on, but this is prevalent nationwide. <clears throat> There is also a gender gap in publishing in science and engineering disciplines in the United States, but in many other countries. So what this figure is showing right here is number of active authors. This was a, a publication from 2020 where they looked at about 2 million different articles and looked at the gender of um, the, the first author from 1950 to 2000, and blue is the male author and this reddish color are the female authors. You see down in 1950, 1945, 14% of the authors were female. So we've made leaps and bounds because in 2005, 35% of the authors of science and engineering papers are women, but it's still not 50%. This figure shows that there is a huge variability by scientific and engineering discipline. So in mathematics, only 15% of the first authors are women. In engineering, 17%. <clears throat> 
compared to psychology, 33%, biology is also on the higher spectrum, depending on the type of biology. So, so, you know, when we look at this overall author gender ratio, overall, all disciplines, all years, the female percentage of authors is 26.8%. Okay, way lower than a 50% um, equity in, in publishing. What is really interesting is when you look at this across the country, you see the United States data here, there's really only two countries where we have data from where there's comparable publishing with men and women, Russia, hmm. as you see here and Argentina. Interesting. So, um, that's just something to think about. This is not a United States problem. It is in many other countries, but Russia has figured it out. And we could talk more about that later, but it's pretty interesting data. There is also a gender gap in obtaining external funding. So the National Institutes of Health has been really great at looking at their data and publishing their statistics for obtaining grants. Women only comprise 31% of the awardees of NIH funding. And the data interesting, interestingly, interestingly suggests that the funding rates between women and men are not significantly different once the first grant has been landed. So in other words, as soon as you've got your first grant, you're more likely to get your second and your third. You know, you've made it. But what's happening is that it is more difficult for women scientists to get that first grant <clears throat> than it is their male counterparts. Then when you look at some of the um, data for scientists of color, there are huge inequities in particularly black scientists. And this is data that NIH has published. From 2011 to 2015, black scientists received R01, which is the, the, the main sort of bread and, bread and butter NIH grant, your lead PI grant, only half as often as their white peers. So what does this mean? This means that our black faculty members are submitting twice as many grants as our white faculty members to get funded at the same rate. And for any of you who've ever written an R01 <laughs> grant proposal, this is not something you sit down and do in a week. This takes extensive amount of time. It takes extensive amount of time to get the preliminary data, to do the research, to get enough data to put in your grant to actually make it competitive. And our black faculty members are spending significantly more time doing this. So that means that they're not publishing as much because they're writing grants. And it, it, it is a huge, huge impact. The other um, information here that comes out of an NIH study is that black and Asian scientists must resubmit applications several times before they are awarded an R01 grant and black and Hispanic scientists are less likely to resubmit applications. And black scientists were less likely to be awarded an R01 grant on their first or second attempt. So what this means is submit a grant. If you're not funded, the thing to do is to read the comments, collect more data, you know, make revisions and resubmit it again. If you're not doing that, your chance of getting funded drops way down because basically you're giving up on that whole project on that grant and you're starting from scratch, which, take, which takes significantly more time. So if this is what our faculty are doing, then this is something that we have got to fix because it is leading to this very stark inequity between our, our different faculty groups. So here's a look at our demographic data and this demonstrates both gender 
and diversity gaps. So this is data that Fran very nicely uh, pulled for Celestina and I in a very short time frame. So thank you, Fran. Um, so this is from 2020. And what I what I want to focus on here, well, let me just explain what this is first. So like in that previous graph, this is full professor, associate professor, assistant professor. This is our white faculty um, in female and male categories. And then we have underrepresented groups. We have race and ethnicity unknown, and then our total. And I wanna highlight the fact that at WSU, we do not have um, a great rate of our faculty members identifying their race and eth ethnicity. And so you see that we have um, a fair number of people who we just don't know what their race and ethnicity is. So we have to take that into account that if we knew that, we would have much a much better understanding of some of the impacts of, um, well, some of the inequities that we might be seeing. So- Can I interject a quick question? Yes. If any of the data show since the assistant professor line looks more attractive than mm -hmm. as you move up, if there's an age cross tab, like I understand some of the biological realities and family issues that could affect the numbers, but is it that perhaps we're improving and some of those new professors haven't been in the pipeline long enough to adjust the upper tier numbers. So absolutely, yes. Um, let, can we just talk through this table first well, and sorry, then I'll I'll address mean, that? Because that is something that I that I do think is to important you, to address. I'm trying to prove you got me thinking. So. That's excellent. <laughs> and, and, and you actually interpreted the table before we yeah, actually started yeah. to explain it. <laughs> you get the gold star award. Yeah. That's right. Um, okay, so if we start down at the assistant professor level and we look at total by gender, the percentages, like we showed for the 2019 data, we're, we're pretty good, right? We're almost equal men and women at the assistant level professor. At associate level, um, now we have 62% men and 38% women. At the full professor level, 74% men and 26% women. Now, yes. Some of this may be reflecting the fact that we are doing much better today at being um, gender inclusive in who we're hiring at the assistant level, and those women faculty just haven't made it up the ranks yet. That's That for sure is the case. But I've been here 20 years. You know, I'm a woman. I got promoted to full professor a number of years ago. There are lots, even when I came... 20 years ago, at least in Vancouver, we were really good at the assistant level professor of gender parity. So I, I think that's a piece of the explanation, but it's not everything for sure. Um, certainly, as, as I indicated previously, women are spending more time at the assistant, at the associate level rank once they go up for promotion, they're just as, just as successful as men, but they're just spending more time at that associate level professor. And that's something that we can work on and we can really try to improve. Um, so now if we look at our demographic data, if we look at our white faculty of color, at the assistant level professor, we actually have more white females than we do males. At the associate professor level, we're, we're almost equal again, which is great. At the full professor level, this is where we show a large difference. So with white faculty of color, equal assistant and associate. But then if we look at our faculty or from historically underrepresented groups, we see a different story. At the associate level, women are only 5% of the faculty 
um, of the associate professor faculty and men are 36%. You even see this in the race and ethnicity unknown. And then when we get to the full professor level, we see the same thing. So this figure, this table is telling us that we have some gender disparity in getting to that full professor rank. And it's even worse for our faculty of color. I'm gonna let Celestina let. Um, <laughs> Celestina is gonna talk for the rest Great. of the time. Thank you. Thanks, Christine. So one thing that I want to start off with right away is that we are focusing on tenure and tenure track faculty only because we're focusing on research, not to say that our other ranks are not engaged in research, not to say that there aren't disparities in the other ranks. We provide that uh, data that Fran gave us in the appendix. So you can all look at that. Um, so this is why you're seeing just, we're just calling out the tenured and tenure track faculty um, here. Um, so as we are looking, I think um, Regent Cerna, it was your question at the May Regents meeting. You couldn't uh -huh. tell I was muted and on Zoom at my kitchen table, but I cheered when you asked, you know, how does this break down by gender and race and ethnicity? And so this was really the, it was really your question. That was really the, the, the driving force behind this. Um, so as you can look at these percents and, and the raw numbers there, we're not even going to break it out by gender and race and ethnicity because those numbers are, are quite low in some of these categories. Um, and so we don't want to present at an identifiable um, level here. But you can see when we're looking at a grand total of a little over a thousand uh, tenured and tenure track uh, faculty, we have 26% there that we don't know their race or ethnicity. Um, we can talk a little bit about what we could hypothesize um, or um, in that group there. We have uh, over half that are white. Um, you see 2%, two or more races. We have native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islanders at 0.3%. Hispanic of any race, 3%, Black or African American, 1%, Asian, 12%, and American Indian or Alaska Native at 0.6%. This is not just WCO. This is reflective of nationwide um, in higher ed. So this is not to just say this is, um, we're showing you WCU data, uh, but this is what we're seeing across um, across the nation. Um, so as we look at recruitment strategies, this is the recruitment pool that we're also looking at. We heard, um, you know, we often hear that analogy of the leaky pipeline, as Christine was talking about that progression um, and how women and, and faculty of color leak out of this pipeline. But a lot of People have said, you know, when you have a leaky pipe, when you have a leaky pipe in your home, you don't blame the water, right? You you can't mentor the water back into that pipe. It's really about changing the structure, changing that pipe, because we are obviously losing women um, and faculty of color. So I want to talk a little bit about the COVID-19 pandemic. This is a quote um, that I think really helps set the stage here. It's from the executive director of the UN for Women um, at the Commission of Status of Women conference this year. It says the COVID-19 pandemic is the most discriminatory crisis we women and girls have ever experienced. When you have an overlay then of women of color, you can imagine COVID-19 is not um, the most discriminatory crisis, but on top of everything else. So the pandemic, I know um, we were able to present um, to you earlier this year about how the pandemic, we, 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 a lot of us had to change our, we had to pivot our research. We, we tried to focus on COVID-19 issues and we talked just a little bit about some issues that researchers were having in the lab and collecting data but it did impact research productivity in a variety of ways. And we now have a lot of literature nationwide about how exactly it did impact researchers and research. Um, the most adverse effects that um, we see are those working with human subjects, bench scientists, women scientists, and scientists with young children. And we'll see that. That picture there I've taken from a documentary called Picture Scientist. If you have not seen it, it's on Netflix. I encourage you to watch it. It's called Picture Scientist. Um, it won't leave your mind anytime soon after watching it. So please, um, please watch that. So here is um, a, a, a bar graph here. The longer the graph, it is uh, the, the most research time lost. So the large, those uh, large um, bars there, you can see that's how much time has lost. You can look by um, field or discipline there on the left. 
um, on the pink bars, we look to see um, who exactly lost the most time. The bar up on the top says if you had a dependent to zero to five years of age, you lost the most time research-wise. We know this. There's data out now. Um, that's getting a lot of press um, saying that women um, who have children at home worked a full-time job at home, homeschooling their children and doing the childcare um, during the pandemic on top of their full-time job. So I'm sure many of us um, here were in that boat. It's not just, though, having a child at home, because when you look at the three um, bars there at the bottom, the arrows point to it's really being female and having a child at home. Those were the disparities that we have seen with research time. This is national level data, and then we'll talk about some WCU data as well. Can I ask oh, yes, that please. Uh -huh. um, under the third bar, pink, on pink bar, it says closed, non-exempt. Um, can you just sort of clarify? What would that be? It's a classification, I'm assuming. I'm assuming it's not tenured. It looks like that would be the phrasing that these authors would have used since the second one is okay. either tenured and then probably not tenured. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this next graph, I know um, uh, many folks have seen this before, but this was really early on in the pandemic, and we have research that even shows this disparity continuing. Um, but um, men have been publishing more and women have been publishing less is pretty much the story. At the very beginning, as the research administrator, right away we were thinking, wow, okay, so the, they're not in their labs, they're not collecting data, we're going to see a huge increase in grant proposals which we did, um, sitting on editorial boards, we knew we were gonna get swamped with manuscripts about six months after um, university shut down, and we saw that for sure. Um, we knew we were, we were prepared for that. And then Christine, can you share that quote from what you were saying about who was actually publishing then? I, I heard this at a, um, a webinar that it's the privileged who are publishing. <clears throat> Yeah. So regardless even of gender or any other status, it really is when we think about it, it is those that have the privileges, those that were able um, to publish and continue writing those grant proposals during the pandemic. Um, you can see that um, men were all author analyses and then first author analyses across uh, various um, publishing houses there. Um, we saw the greatest increase there. So then in looking at WCO, um, this was out of uh, the provost office. It was a WCU faculty survey. So thank you, uh, Laura, for meeting with us and, and chatting with us about this too. Um, WCU conducted a faculty survey in the late spring of 2020 and then repeated in mid-fall um, to assess faculty workload uh, during COVID-19. They had a pretty good response rate there of over 30%. So uh, 770 um, faculty, um, about half women, um, uh, filled out this survey. And the main lessons learned here was that pre-tenure, tenure track faculty are just disproportionately affected and scholarship activities were really what was driving women pre-tenure um, being extremely affected here. Another quick question. Mm -hmm. um, career track, do you mean like clinical professors? Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yes. So 40% reported a standstill or major adjustments in research, scholarship, or create, creative activity. And you can see the breakdown there, 43%. Um, women um, reported a standstill and 36% uh, men. And then you can see based on a uh, track there. So folks that were tenured, 36% reported a standstill or major adjustment. Uh, Pre-tenure, 46%. We see that really driving that number there in career track, 41%. So the endorsement of this item, I think, is very telling. I've been at a near or complete standstill. 52% of pre-tenured women endorsed that item. 0% pre-tenured men endorsed that item. So what are we doing? So this is a problem, as we've been talking about, worldwide, nationwide. There are a lot of things that WSU is working on. 
Um, and we're going to need to do a whole lot more as well. Um, the first off that I want to talk about is that equity lens that we just we just sat through that presentation and utilizing that lens and being able to utilize that lens as we look at policies, practices, et cetera. Um, also communicating the importance of self-reporting race and ethnicity. So you saw a large group of WC faculty are not reporting race and ethnicity. And there is some research um, that shows in various types of research um, designs, it's going to be those from minoritized populations that don't report. However, we're not doing that type of research here at WSU, right? I know as uh, the, the morning that Workday launched at 8 a.m., I clicked in to make sure Hispanic was checked, right? I know that's important, and I was doing that. I don't know who else was doing that, but I wanted to make sure that it was there. Um, and we can have a discussion about that. My my thinking is that we're probably going to see that it's majority um, white and male there. Um, cluster hires, mentoring, and research focused on underserved communities is also going to help this. As we are looking at these cluster hires for recruitment, that is going to be really needed. Mentoring, it's not just recruitment, it's retaining our faculty of color and our women. When we have research focused on underserved communities and when this is a priority and when this is highlighted, that means we get to work with those underserved communities. That means we get to hire faculty that have expertise in, from, in the, working with those communities communities and research coordinators and research assistants that are living in those communities. Um, that is going to really, really help uh, with these efforts. We have guiding principles in the provost tenure and promotion guidelines to move away from this one size fits all. Many of us grew up in this one size. You had to look this way to get tenured. You had to look this way to be a full professor. And we're moving away from that. I think that's going to be crucial. And um, what does it look like? What does it look like if you do a research with an underserved community and it takes you years to work with that community and build trust because there is so much distrust with universities and with research practices in that community? You're not going to look lockstep with someone else that is the traditional um, associate professor or someone going up um, for tenure. Um, we had uh, policies that can continue on with the tenure clock stopping um, during COVID-19 um, and also COVID-19 related modified duties. Equally important to that, I think, because when you stop the clock because you've had a child or you've stopped the clock because you were homeschooling your child, that is then you are then longer delayed, right? And, that, and, and with that comes also additional pay and things like that. So I think equally important here is achievement relevant to opportunity. This framework for annual reviews, I think that is crucial. If your opportunity was limited, but you still were able to achieve things, then that is okay because it is about this opportunity and having that lens um, through the provost office, really guiding that and, and really um, working with department chairs and deans um, for annual reviews on this, I think is going to be crucial. So that brings us to also our questions for all of you <laughs> and that we know that so much needs to be done here. We know that WCU is not um, so different from a lot of um, other institutions of higher ed with struggling with these problems that the COVID-19 pandemic added on top of existing disparities and we see them now exacerbated. We would love a conversation with all of you to hear what you're doing in your own organizations to support um, equity and how you can help us here mitigate inequities in research. Thanks. Thank you. Excellent. Very thought provoking. Um, so um, just it's an interesting um, as a mother of a 19 year old um, daughter who is getting her chemical engineering degree at the University of Arizona. She is one of two women in um, most of the track classes that consist of well over 150 students. And, um, and she's really unfortunately learning the, you know, that Laura could write a book on this, but um, what that feels like to be just, you know, just based on how she looks, how she is being underestimated from the get-go, um, 
not to mention her gender. So it's, it's just so fascinating and a very tough conversation as a parent and as a female who has also struggled through leadership opportunities of this is, this is your path. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, so much work can be done here. So, um, I'm thankful that there are women like you that are trying to kind of raise the bar here. So appreciate it. Um, Regent Powell. A um, couple of comments. Um, one of the things that seems to be a limiting step on this is a tenure promotion is the getting the research grants. Mm -hmm. And of course, as I know you both know very well, um, NIH gets committees that review and they make those selections. Mm -hmm. um, so it's we can we can reset some of our priorities mm -hmm. and and criteria, but it's it's hard to deal with that. Mm -hmm. um, and that's so key to you know the, the long term careers. So do you know um, if NIH mm -hmm. is making some major progress in really making it more of an equitable process. Yeah, I, 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 they are making progress in that as an NIH reviewer, I had to take a 15 minute training on implicit bias. <laughs> so there's that. <laughs> I don't know if I would call it major okay, progress. Yeah. They put out their statistics, they haven't changed. Um, they are, I believe, looking at committing um, more money for mentoring, the K awards, the diversity supplements, the early ones. But I would argue we need that at the R01 level. We need that at the center grant level, the ones that are really making careers, the ones that are really helping to identify those for professor positions. Um, I'm not seeing that done right now, um, but, but hopefully it will be um, in the future. Yeah, I'll just add a little bit um, because, well, Celestine and I both sit on different review panels, but I sat on one maybe a month ago. And afterwards, I called the program officer and I said, look, I just have to say I'm really disappointed at the lack of diversity on this panel. I mean, some of the people on that panel were the old established people when I was a graduate student. So, you know, that is perpetuating itself, which really brings back to this, the toolkit that it's not just about the furniture, it's disrupting the system. Um, and so, you know, we had this conversation and I think the challenge is that NIH is a very large organization. And as this program officer was telling me, they move at snail's pace, but it takes us, it takes people like us on the panels, it takes everybody at the table who is in some sort of position of power to have those conversations and really start putting pressure on those institutions. Um, as Celestina said, yeah, they're making some small changes, but the, the statistics, the data are not changing. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's where there is now much more public um, blogging and mm -hmm. articles are being written. And mm -hmm. there was a really great opinion piece that was called Fund Black Scientists mm -hmm. that was directly calling out NIH, mm -hmm. this is what you need to be doing. So people are starting to do things, you know, again, it's like, what's taking so long? Mm -hmm. um, but, I, but I think at least now those conversations are starting to be had. Um, and, I, and I think it's, that's, that's really important because if you do have a good diverse um, group looking at those grants, they're going to look at things a little different. And, you know, too much of it has been, um, oh, he's my buddy, I, I know his research and therefore, yeah. or he's gotten lots of awards from us before and therefore. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that's, that's one thing. Um, I, I have a daughter that um, got her PhD in biology from WSU in, in Pullman a few years ago, and then she went on a postdoc. And when she started, unfortunately during COVID, is when she was getting ready to find um, a, an academic position. One of the things, and this sort of goes to preparing students, um, that she found as a challenge 
was, even though she, when she taught as a graduate student, she got extremely high ratings. The problem she came up against was she didn't have the teaching experience. Mm -hmm. And um, just to think about um, how we can help prepare our, our graduate students who are going to go forward, because that seemed to be a barrier that she hadn't been expecting because she's, right. she's got good citations and that type of stuff, but it was, that was exactly what it was. And she finally did get a job, but it's, um, you know, it's, it's a challenge. Absolutely. It is a challenge. And I think graduate programs are doing a better job at providing opportunities for professional development for graduate students. Um, and there's more emphasis on graduate students understanding pedagogy, but we still don't do it really, really well. I will say that thanks to OB's partnership, we've been able to include graduate students in our base training here on campus, and they've been going to some of the curriculum development workshops because they're our next future generation of university professors and they need to understand how to teach with an equity mindset. Um, that's something that I think we need to start having implemented throughout all of WSU and all of the graduate programs. Um, but I, I, I think you're right. You know, graduate students are being trained in a somewhat different way than they were, you know, 20 so years ago, because it's highly unlikely that the majority of them will get academic positions. I mean, it's less than 20% who actually follow an academic university career path. Um, so we're doing a little bit better job of training them to understand they have skills and they can go into industry or be science writers and stuff, but still not as good as we should be. Absolutely. I will say, though, that when she was here at WSU and going through her, um, her PhD ex, um, education, she, did, she was really felt supported. That's right. I mean, there are always times when it's very rough on graduate students and all that type of stuff. But, um, you know, she she felt very supported during that that time. And I want to thank you all for the all the work you're doing on this, because bringing these things to light is really important. If you don't under if you if you don't have an understanding about what's going on, you can never fix it. One thing just to add to that, you brought up teaching evaluations, and we have about three decades of research that we didn't even talk about showing that teaching evaluations are heavily biased as well. Mm -hmm. And women and faculty of color get lower um, scores on uh, teaching evaluations. Um, but we use that as part of the tenure portfolio. So with uh, the provost's office really driving this, how do, we, how do we change that? Because we've known for 30 years now that it's not equitable, but we continue to use it as a benchmark for success. Regent Redden. Um, pretty easy fix for that, that that universities have used for a long time is adjusting for grade inflation. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you if you know what the research says, you just apply a factor to it and to equalize those things. But um, so you asked for some input from industry. First of all, stats in industry are much worse than your stats. So, uh, you know, it's not like we're leading the way and particularly in the more traditionally male dominated industries like tech and finance, where I, I sit the intersection of those two. So no magic uh, bullets from me, except that I would say, um, you know, putting the right people in charge of the money is the most important thing. So whether that's at NIH or internally with us, it's it's back to using the tool because the money, you know, is the thing that drives everything. So you've got to put women and underrepresented uh, minorities in charge of the money uh, and and make sure that that's um, that that's flowing the right way. Some of the things that are working in industry are really emphasizing childcare being provided um, yes. and including crazy things. Like I've, I've known some tech CEOs who've given their high performing women night nurses um, when they have the baby because they're like, we're just gonna like shower you with resources because the faster we can get you back into productivity, the, the more we will benefit. Um, and then uh, some things that are more systemic, I, you know, when I was thinking about the tool and asking about like, how deep does this go? Uh, and using my furniture versus building analogy, um, I think the tenure system itself 
is mm -hmm. something that we need to call yeah. into question. Um, it's uh, it's you know, pretty antiquated. It's, yeah, it's very antiquated. It's um, you know it reinforces a lot of the things that we then you know try to change through mentoring and dollars and you know. But it's it's this thing that is that is sitting over a lot of what is um, you know is causing us to have an unrealistic cost structure and everything else. So. I think, you know, we need to put that on the table. And then the other thing that's that's also hard is that in terms of attracting both women and underrepresented minorities, you have to be geographically located in the right place. Right. Um, one of the advantages that UW has over us is that for dual career families, which women are often going to be in, or for underrepresented minority faculty, um, that environment is just more hospitable in terms of access to culturally relevant resources and communities and then also dual career families where there's lots of job optionality. Um, so as we're thinking about, you know, how do we move the needle on some of this stuff, we may move the needle more in some of our campuses that are better situated for those things like this one, for example. Um, but also we may need to think about where else should we be? I mean, mm -hmm. one of the things that's happening in tech right now is that Seattle based companies that have been beating their head against the wall on racial diversity are opening offices in Atlanta mm -hmm. because they're like, we are going to have a much better job of building diverse yeah, workforce so. in Atlanta than we can in Seattle. <laughs> and so, you know, and and obviously we're not going to go locate a campus in Atlanta, I don't think, although Northeastern, <laughs> you know, has certainly followed that model. But um, we do need to be mindful of Seattle versus Pullman uh, in terms of being hospitable to underrepresented minorities. Mm -hmm. Thank Absolutely. You. I think two two quick things just to say. We have one of our campuses that have child that has child care on campus. So absolutely with that. Tell I Santa, think, can you speak up? Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. Oh, you know what? It's hard to hear. Yeah. No, we have um, one of our campuses that has child care um, on, on their campus. And so we hear from faculty, women, and graduate students saying, we need this. We need this. Um, and um, to, to your other point about location, I think that is huge. And I think as not just recruiting, but retaining faculty, when they have to choose every day, they have to choose their job over their family. If they have kids and their kids are the only kids of color in the classroom, every day we're making that choice to be in a city that doesn't reflect our family as opposed to maybe working elsewhere, you know, and maybe changing the structure to allow for people to work in other diverse areas, even if we can't have a campus there, but how, you know, how, how that, how, how can we, how can we put everything on the table to look at it um, and see what works? And if we say, oh, but they're not going to be mentored in, you know, they're going to miss out on these networking opportunities. Well, then, then let's change the structure so that they can fly into those. Let's provide that travel. And, and the other thing I will say from experience looking at women in tech and women in finance less mentoring, more money. Yes, uh, right. You know, the yeah. mentoring is just yes. not the important yeah. factor. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Into that. Okay. I, I just want to talk <clears throat> about the child care piece mm -hmm. um, because it's vitally important. Mm -hmm. It's a national crisis right now that was just amplified, highlighted with COVID, that all of a sudden People were at home looking after their kids and child care centers closed. And many of them have not reopened, including the one on WC Vancouver's campus for financial reasons. And, you know, there was this article that Celestina read and passed to some of us the other day that was talking about strategies to mitigate some of these problems. And we always say, well, it's expensive. We can't do it. And the counter argument to that was, well, we can raise money for a whole bunch of things. We can raise money for athletics. We can raise money for lots of things. Why can't we raise money to keep women faculty in their jobs, to attract them? I mean, it's, it's, it's so hard when you hear a young woman faculty member who says, I came here because there was a child care center for my child and now it's closed. And we are working actively to try to bring that back to our campus under a very different model. But, you know, we have to change the structure 
the infrastructure to provide these mm. things, to provide the support if we truly want to keep women and faculty of color in our institution. And it's not okay to say it's expensive. We can't do it. We've got to go beyond that and find ways to do it. Okay. Um, I'm going to take one last comment from Regent Sims as we still have a couple more things we have to do. So, who's doing who is doing this really well? I mean, there's who is doing. I mean, <laughs> there's got to be some university out there who's doing it really well. Otherwise, you're going to tell me that all of them are failing. So, mm -hmm. who is doing it really well? Well, I think, um, and this again is a money piece, but there are some private institutions that are doing this very well, that they are, they're able to have philanthropy dollars support women supporting child care. Um, yeah, I, I would say bits and pieces. So there, usually what we will hear is women, uh, faculty women will come here and say, well, wait a second, at my other institution, we had this. And another one will say, at another institution, I had access to this. And so I think there's bits and pieces that we can learn from other universities. I don't know one that is really attracting all of the women and, and has better rates than WCU. But I think that we need to we need to be learning from what is being done nationwide and trying to build it here. Can you share that with with the some of us uh, to, with the regents because I'm really I think we were in this, this we had the same discussion last year uh, and I remember the year before so we're <laughs> into the third year and I'm an old guy and I would like to see a resolution before yes. I go bye bye. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Ron's got a lot of things on the list. Yeah, we got so We're under nice, clock. <laughs> you could just just send ideas yeah. through the president so we could take a look and actually move to solution mm -hmm. rather than talking. Um, yep. Thank you. Yep. Yep. I want to make one quick comment. Mm -hmm. um, I have over the years met um, with this, a group of professional women on the Pullman campus when we came for regents meetings. One of the things that came up year after year and mostly with clinical professors is something you mentioned briefly and that is women tend to get more assignments which keep them from mm -hmm. doing some of the other things they need to be doing in their career and they do it because they're really good at it yeah mm because -hmm. we all know how multitasking all this type of stuff but that is a real key factor to figure out mm -hmm. how do you control that yeah. because it is a major distraction away from career mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and women are less good at saying no yeah. uh -huh. so one of the things that we are working really hard at is um the mentoring committee for junior faculty that when somebody, a woman faculty member or anybody is asked, could you do this service committee? Don't say yes or no right away. Say, I need to go check with my mentoring committee because then the mentoring committee will say, don't do that. <laughs> so so I'm glad you hear that. it doesn't always work, but we are trying to, to do that. Absolutely. And there is much more focus, I think, now than there used to be on protecting our junior faculty, mm -hmm. our women, our faculty of color from too many service, mm -hmm. good, too many service good. activities because it ha it hinders we got their progress. The other thing that we didn't really talk about just really quickly is that often women and faculty of color are the ones that students seek out yes. mm -hmm. yes. for for mentoring themselves, for right. advice, to telling their stories yes. during this challenging time. And that is time consuming, but it's mentally taxing mm -hmm. and it's exhausting. Yeah. Regent so, Shower, I'm sorry to interrupt. Just, just a super yeah, quick ahead. comment considering the fact on this campus, we're proud of saying from preschool to PhD. And so I would like for us to talk a little bit about that financial strategy, um, because I do think it's a major part of what we're trying to do here in terms of recruiting. Um, and I would just add your last comment was really an important one. Um, having spent almost two decades in civil engineering, it's about mentoring and a future generation seeing themselves as both a woman and an engineer, or a woman and a professor. And so another reason why having children on this campus to see themselves and a pathway forward is so critically important. So I, I'm not saying that it needs to be money that we need to reallocate, but um, certainly would be willing to be part of helping to uh, drive private philanthropy towards this. Mm -hmm. It's so critically right. important. So, thank, thank you. Thank, thank you for you. all the work that you yeah. do. Thank you. Uh, thank you. It's an excellent. Just. 
we could sit here all day actually <laughs> to, to, on all of the discussion that we've had this morning. So um, to both of you, thank you for again being inspiring around um, and a advocates and a good voice for where we're trying to go and would ask that on behalf of the regents you keep us accountable to the work that you're doing i think it's really important so we, i'd like to kind of continue the conversations on both of these things we have done and figure out how it becomes more a part of our regent um, kind of agenda of where are we how are we looking let's get an update and understand so that we aren't just doing this once a year as well coming back to your point of talking a lot but not driving to solutions so thank you very yeah, much thank Thanks you for your time nice job. Um, we are moving now into a um, future action item um, and so we have Don Shearer from our foundation um, who will be presenting to us you can come right up here Don thank you Everybody else had a partner. Yeah, <laughs> you're a one-man show here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, um, I'm going to read through this so I don't miss any points. So okay. Apologize for that. Um, thank you, Chair Dickinson and members of the Board of Regents for your time and consideration today regarding this future action item. Number one, the WSU Foundation Consolidated Endowment Fund Investment Policy Statement and Spending Policy. As outlined in the policy, we're seeking the Board of Regents approval of the amended document. It went through a careful review and amendment by the WSU Foundation's external legal counsel, Terry Kelly, as well as WSU's Attorney General, Danielle Hess, and Vice President of Finance and Administration and Chief Financial Officer, Stacy Pearson, and the WSU Foundation Board of Directors reviewed and approved the policy as written on October 21st, 2021. As you may know, the Investment Committee of the Washington State University Foundation is charged with the responsibility for investment management of property and assets held for investment by the WSU Foundation, planned gift assets held in trust or agreement by the WSU Foundation, and Washington State University's assets entrusted to the WSU Foundation for investment and management by agreement with the university. The agreement between WSU and the WSU Foundation requires the WSU Foundation to invest and distribute funds held on behalf of the university in accordance with the governing gift instrument and then applicable WSU Foundation Consolidated Endowment Fund Investment Policy Statement and Spending Policy, which I'll refer to as the invest Investment Policy Statement moving forward. The investment policy statement addresses composition, appointment, duties, and reporting of the investment committee, investment objectives, asset allocation, and spending policy for endowed funds. The agreement between WSU and the WSU Foundation requires all proposed changes to the investment policy statement be presented to and approved by the governing boards of the WSU Foundation and the university prior to becoming effective. Revisions were made to the investment policy statement to update fiduciary language associated with the governance structure of the WSU Foundation boards, updates to the WSU and WSU Foundation staff titles, clarification of committee names and general grammatical and or formatting, change, formatting changes, and your materials I believe it was provided to you with a red line copy of the investment policy statement so you could see the extent of changes as well as the final version of what was presented to the Foundation Board of Directors last month. I would like to call to your attention the following sections which will include various revisions on the purpose and background, updates to the description of the investment committee given its revised charter to include, include investment reference to planned gift assets, statements of that the investment policy statement only applies to the endowed assets of the WSU Foundation and University and not to the planned gift assets of the WSU Foundation. The investment committee charter is included as appendix D to the investment policy statement. Statement to reflect that the WSU Foundation is a separate and independent entity from the university and is neither a state agency nor its functional equivalent. 
and then general grammatical references updates. Under the composition appointment reporting section, removal of limit of number of ex officio, non-voting members of the investment committee, inclusion of language for the preferred representation on the investment committee, including expertise, term limit revision to align, to align with investment committee charter, and the description of ex officio membership to the investment committee by the university chief financial officer and vice president for finance and administration, the CEO of the WSU Foundation, and the chief financial officer of the WSU Foundation, as well as the removal of term limits for these members, inclusion of reporting requirements by the investment committee chair to the WSU Foundation Board of Directors and the University Board of Regents and Administrators. Information pertaining to the meetings was updated to align with the investment committee charter under 2.11 directors of WSU Foundation, inclusion of statement to approve the investment committee charter annually, language updated to identify instead of approving a group of higher education institutions where the WSU Foundation can benchmark its results with endowments of similar in size, and removal of two responsibilities which now will fall under the purview of the investment committee. Under 2.12 regents of WSU, general updates to include word investment to identify the committee being referred to, 2.21 duties, again language updates to reflect the investment committee clarifying language and spell out the full title investment policy statement and spending policy. Additional guidelines to keep the finance committee informed of any changes to the spending rate applicable to the endowment endowed fund, excuse me. And the 2.3 chair of the committee. Removal of chair term limit. Update to WSU Foundation staff title to reflect China, uh, chief financial officer or designee. And removal of qualification to be a member of the board of directors, and 2.4 WSU Foundation CFO, staff title update to reflect WSU Foundation chief financial officer or designee. While this is extensive and updates, the core guidelines of the investment policy statement rem remain largely unchanged from previous iterations. If you have any questions, please let me know. Otherwise, beyond on behalf of the WSU Foundation Board of Directors and the Investment Committee, I would likely, I kindly request approval of the investment policy statement by the Board of Regents upon which the amended policy will become effective. Questions for Don? Real quick. Yep. Um, up on um, the background piece where um, it says, WSU Foundation is a separate and independent entity from the university and is neither a state agency or its functional equivalent. One of the things that um, we're sort of set up to not necessarily align with that is the fact that the foundation uses the WSU.edu extension on emails, mm -hmm. which sort of would have uh, um, presume an affiliation with the university and as a state agency because it's got the .gov or .edu rather. So I just mentioned that as something to think about. Okay. Maybe it should be a WS, you know, UF or something like that. I, I realize that would be a bit of a nightmare to change because everybody's been using that email, but it does um, sort of um, infer that there is that 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 linkage since it follows with the same email. Well, I appreciate that. We'll take that back and discuss it with our IT folks. This will be um, an item that we will vote on in January at our January meeting. So any other questions? Thank you, Don. We appreciate you being here. Well, thank you. And thank you for letting me read through all that. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Um, okay, we um, also have an action item that we will vote on tomorrow, but that is um, our 2023 Board of Regents meeting schedule. It's kind of crazy to actually think about that. Um, and so just two things that I wanted to incorporate here that I think are probably necessary um, is one, um, it, 
going forward, I know we have kind of been in this hybrid mode and, and working to accommodate folks that can't be here and, and be in person, but we are returning um, as a board of regents to meeting in person. Um, and the, the, the real concept behind that is the continuity we get in being able to have conversations and and in, interact with one another, not just around the table or via Zoom, but offline. Um, as a public board, you know, we need the opportunity to be able to converse with one another um, where it is not in a public setting every time we speak with each other. So we are going back in person, asking people to be in person. We are accommodating and doing something a little unique in that going forward, um, we are trying to create specific meetings that can be virtual, i.e. our January meeting, um, where we give everybody just a moment to not necessarily have to travel right out of the gate at the first of the year. So we're trying to kind of have more consistency around if we're going to be virtual, we'll all be virtual. If we're going to be in person, we look to all being in person so that we can create and contain and um, continue continuity amongst the board. Any questions on that or concerns around that? I have uh, two questions, actually. One is, so what will this look like for transparency, not for us at the board, but for other folks who are interested in, in watching, but might be located across the state? So it's my understanding we'll still be doing the meetings, um, Shane, where people can um, yeah. access that electronically. Okay. It's just the board is being asked to be in person. Okay, great. And then a question that I had about dates in general um, was I was just curious what the process for, I noticed I looked back through some of the dates, and that they're really consistently like the same weeks of months. Um, and somebody from student government brought it to my attention that our September meeting start was on um, Yom Kippur, which is a Jewish holiday. And, and I was just curious if there was any um, like checking or, or thinking about religious holidays and when these dates are selected and what that might mean for access for different folks. I would just say um, there are a lot of different uh, challenges with setting the time and avoiding everything um, and so I, we will be sensitive to that we'll we'll look and check for that so i just it, it becomes difficult to sort of find a time that doesn't interfere with with uh, some of those things so i think all i can say shane is we'll look at that we'll try and make sure we find dates that avoid those major type of holidays but we also acknowledge there may be some times very difficult to find that so Thank, Thank you for the question. Bring to our attention. Okay, so um, at Can I this, take one of the, yep. Oh, sorry. Yep. Go ahead. Well, thanks, Marty, about you know trying to do that part in person. Just so you know, on our side, we we have uh, asked uh, our leadership team who's here that if you're going to be on Thursday of the Regents meeting, following this meeting, we expect people to do it in person. And you know, sometimes folks, well, you got to travel all that way for my report or my discussion item. We, we just really feel that if the regents are going to be here in person on that Thursday set of things, we need the presenters to also uh, be in person. So it's not you guys be here. We won't be. But I think that's important for us because it's the hallway conversations we find the two, three people going, hey, I just thought of something that's missing when we don't when we don't have everybody present. And that's a really important part, I believe, of board function. So. Marty and I both talked about this, and both parties we think it's really important to commit to being here whenever possible. Yep. Thank you. Okay, so now we get to go to the groundbreaking ceremony, which is 11:30, um, and so we'll go out to that. Where and how does lunch work after that, Des? As soon as the groundbreaking finishes, yep. we'll move back into this room over here for the lunch. Okay. Okay. So that's for the regents, correct? For the regents. Okay, perfect. And then you will be reconvening at one o'clock in your committee sessions, 115. which one fifteen, excuse me. And those um, rooms are designated on the agenda.